For an overall optimum experience with our system, we recommend that you obtain a used alternator from a local junkyard near you. Here's the easy way to find one. Go to car-parts.com. After you've went to car-parts.com, fill in the search criteria for your vehicle. Put in alternator. The bottom two search boxes, put in distance and your zip code. Before disassembly, just to save yourself a ton of headaches later, we're going to take a hammer and a center punch and mark this Ford alternator right where the through bolt goes through on these raised up bosses. Just put two little dots or one little dot right here and then on the accompanying piece right there that way when you sandblast or buff or paint or anything that you do you can always easily line it back up again for reassembly. Hello and welcome to the Rebuild Your Own High Amp 3G alternator video. Here you can see the two different sizes. The one size is identifiable. The smallest one, the 95 amp, by the four holes right there. And the larger 130 amp version is identifiable by the two holes in between the spokes. There you can see the four holes in between the spokes, which is the smaller 95 amp diameter. And there you can see the two holes between the spokes, which is the larger diameter 130 amp version. But now that we have our core, let's just take a minute and inspect the condition that it's in. First thing, if you're buying these from a yard, you want to try and get one that's in fairly decent shape. Try and avoid a lot of corrosion on one because as you can see, we're going to look at the outside in this area right here and inspect that for any cracks that run vertically. Look all the way around and you can see there's no cracks or brakes but this one here the one that has a lot of corrosion on it has a break where the corrosion ruined it so before we get started we want to make sure like this here is not on your core if you do find a crack in the side of your housing though or if you're taking it apart and it cracks after you started taking it apart no need to panic you can call us they're not real expensive we can send you one so we're ready to start tearing this thing apart first thing to come off is the voltage regulator brush holder assembly you'll see these four screws here that I've highlighted in red those are T20's take those four out these two here you don't have to mess with right now. There's the Torx head tool you need to pull those four bolts out. Here it is already removed from the alternator. This is the voltage regulator underneath you can see the uh, brush holder assembly. These are the two brushes. These are gone. And then there's the four screws. Take those and uh, put them aside so you can clean them up really good with a buffing wheel or a wire toothbrush. If you take this apart and um, say you lose a spring, one of the springs flies out or something because the brush didn't stay in place, don't worry about it. We're going to be replacing this whole thing as a unit. It comes with a new voltage regulator and the brushes and brush holder and springs are all included. Next we're going to remove the three through bolts that hold the alternator together. Those are 5 16 heads. They're approximately a quarter inch in diameter. Sometimes they can get a little rough to get out. They don't have a habit of breaking off though because they're a quarter inch in diameter. If you use some uh, rust bust like your WD-40 or something of that nature,
put some in this area here and maybe a little bit up in that area there tap it with a hammer wait about 10-15 minutes and then reapply and then they normally just come right out 5 sixteenths head on them you can even apply a little bit of heat right where the threads are on the outside now we're going to take a hammer and just pop the back lid off there's a bearing cover right here I'm just going to take a uh, 13 millimeter quarter inch drive deep well socket and knock that out. So let's just take a minute here and look at the slip ring. <clears throat> Most of the time you'll see a burn mark on the bottom one, the one that's farthest away from the brush. That's where it wore out, that's where the brush ran out of length and started burning. This one here, um, there's no groove in it, not much of a groove there, usually there's a groove and that's why we supply you with a new slip ring and the instructions on how to replace it. Now we're going to remove the pulley. This is a uh, CP half inch impact, half inch drive, 1516 socket. And you can take this pulley off before you begin taking the alternator apart. You can take it off anytime you want, but from here on out, you have to have it off. Just to be safe, we're going to put a rag on there. And it's just regular uh, right hand threads. The pulley normally comes right off. Now we're going to remove the pulley. This is a CP half inch impact, half inch drive, 1516 socket. And you can take this pulley off before you begin taking the alternator apart. You can take it off anytime you want, but from here on out, you have to have it off. Just to be safe, we're going to put a rag on there. And it's just regular uh, right hand threads. The pulley normally comes right off. You can also use an electric impact. If the pulley is kind of stuck on there, um, a lot of times if it's rust, just put some rust bust or WD-40 down in there, let it soak for a while, and use two medium-sized screwdrivers to get it out. The technique is um, wedge them under there, then twist them at first. Just turn them either both the same way or opposite, and then start to pry it off. Next we're going to put some rust bust WD-40 or whatever you have down in between the inner race of the bearing and the shaft and let that sit for a couple minutes. Also you can put some all the way around this edge if you got some spray that would work really well because you can spray down in from this end get some spray down in these holes all the way around and we're not going for between the windings and the rotor we're trying to get it between the stator windings and the outer plate now what we want to do is get the aluminum plate off of the inner windings this is a little bit challenging in this area 
we recommend some patience because it's not going to just come right off. It takes some work to get it off and a lot of the work can be done just by tapping on this and then flip it over and you want to hit hard enough to disperse any corrosion that's in there but not hard enough to break the plate. If you do break the plate though they are available and they're not real expensive. Then what I'm going to do is hold it by the back and start tapping on the aluminum. For the more stubborn ones, heat is a good thing. This is, this is just a regular propane torch. And if you heat it up on the aluminum part, it will make it a lot easier. But most of them are not real bad. Just keep going around and tapping on the sides and tapping on the sides. And then when you see it start to break loose, when you start seeing a little bit of the laminations coming through, then hold it by the back. And tap on the front, tap on the bottom. And keep going back and forth. So there we have the plate off. We have the rotor, which we're going to be putting a new bearing and a new slip ring on. And then we have the stator rectifier assembly. This is the stator windings, and this is the rectifier assembly, which uh, comes with the kit. So this part is basically a throw away or keep it on a shelf and this part we're going to put new bearings in and this we're going to put a new bearing in and a new slip ring which is the copper rings right here next thing we have to do is we have to get this bearing off of the end so that we can change the slip ring if you got a puller or if you have uh, some sort of tool like a cheese cutter or a bearing splitter that was designed to do this, you could do that. Uh, this method works really well though. I'm just putting it in the vise so it's laying on the bottom bar and not tightening up the vise real tight but get it in there so it's snug. Then this is a uh, six inch quarter inch extension. Don't use your good snap-on or your good uh, Mac tools, but try and find a junky one that's um, been beat on a little bit because we're going to do what you really shouldn't do with tools, but uh, we want to show you a way that tools that are laying around in your garage can be used to get this job done. Just put it on an angle like this, and with a regular hammer, just tap it off. Sometimes you get it stuck at an angle. You might want to just turn this around and tap it from the other side. But they come right off. Now we're looking straight down on the rotor where we just took this bearing off right here. Focus your attention on this wire and the piece coming up. We want to put a nice clean cut right here. Don't disturb this. We want to cut it right in this area right here so that we can remove the um, slip ring. Same thing over here. We want to put a cut as close to the riser part of the wires coming up out of the coil as we can. But the coil where it comes up is protect protected in plastic and we do not want to disturb this plastic right here that's a protector for centrifugal force because it spins really fast and there's a lot of centrifugal force which is held in place and helped to keep from flying open with this plastic reinforcement that you can see from the side right there 
So you can see the wire coming up out of the coil and going up into that plastic reinforcement piece. You want to be able to cut it so that when you do cut it, it doesn't push that out and break that plastic piece. You want to try and cut this right here without pushing that away. The best tool to use for this is a Dremel with a cutoff wheel on it. Or you can use just a regular old pair of wire cutters. Just cut it twice. Cut it first back here so that when you make your initial cut it doesn't push its way over and do any damage to the integrity of the plastic of the riser. Cut it first back here then cut it up here so there's no pushing on the plastic piece. Now we want to get the slip ring up off of the shaft and once again we're going to use the two screwdriver method. If there's not slots in here that you can get the screwdrivers in just take a small drift or a small hammer and tap them in and then Pry that up out of the way. One very important tool for alternator repair is the wire toothbrush. Try and get one that's as clean as possible. If it's got grease or greasy dirt on it, it's not going to work. Um, get the grease off of it, clean it out with some carb cleaner or brake cleaner or something so that you got a nice clean wire toothbrush to get started with. Okay, we're going to scrub this connection up here so that we're prepared to solder to this joint with our slip ring leads. I put a uh, paper towel behind it so you can see. And what I'm doing is I'm holding onto it to give it support with the needle nose so that as I scrub it, it doesn't deteriorate the integrity of the plastic below it. You can scrub on it a little bit without that, but if it gets to the point to where you're really putting pressure on it, hold it from underneath just to give it a little support or hold it from the side. When you're doing a solder connection, the likelihood of your success depends on the cleanliness. So as long as you get it clean, get all the corrosion, get all of any oxidation whatsoever off of there, you're going to have a good melted solder joint. Now I'm doing the other side. And what I'm doing on this particular side, it's a little bit harder to get in there with my needle nose. So I'm going to hold the plastic below with my needle nose, but not squeeze real hard. Here's a visual of what it would look like when it's all completely cleaned up, nice and shiny. Some people would like to use their glass bead blaster in this situation. You can do that, uh, but a lot of glass bead, there's impurities in it. So if you do, just hit it very quickly, very lightly. Keep your um, nozzle back relatively far. And then finish up with the... Uh, toothbrush anyway because there's impurities in the sand and your your wire toothbrush has been cleaned with your carb cleaner brake cleaner or it's brand new and you want to always finish up with the wire toothbrush even if you do have a glass beater 
here's a shot of the slip ring that we're getting ready to put on there you'll notice oxidation occurs in almost no time what's at all just 48 hours sitting at room temperature uh, oxidation starts to work on the copper it's got like a tarnish to it so we want to take our wire toothbrush and even though it's brand new spend a little bit of time and clean that up so it's got a brand new fresh finish to it both sides we're getting ready to uh, push this down onto the shaft alignment is very important because if you're just a little bit off it's going to hit in the wrong place and put a crack in the plastic so take special note of this flat side and this flat side on both ends here and here these line up in these slots here and here so the trick is to set that on there perfectly straight so that when you go down on there there's no interference hitting with that and making it crack I'm getting ready to tap the slip ring down onto the shaft I've put a little bit of white lithium grease on the shaft what I have here is a pretty common three-quarter inch long socket deep wall socket uh, one of the more thicker ones not the thin wall and I just put it up on here get my hammer and start tapping it down slowly tap a little bit and then look from the side to make sure it's going straight I have it sitting in the vise on this ridge try and avoid sitting on the fans they're not real sensitive and you can straighten them back out if one gets dinged a little bit but try and it's sitting in the vise on the jaws on that ridge very important not to go down all the way I'm gonna go a little bit farther than that but you can see the bottom ridge doesn't sit completely down on the body of the rotor itself if you could envision a piece of paper being under there and then taking it down just to where the piece of paper could be pulled out after you're done the top of it looks about like that about that much clearance between the bearing where the bearing is going to bottom out on the shaft and just about this distance right here is what would be a proper location then I'm going to take these leads and a pair of needle nose and bend them around the riser The secret to a good solder joint is to heat both components equally. If you heat just this one, it's, this one doesn't get as hot and you have two different temperatures and you have what's known as a cold solder joint. So it's extremely important that when you're soldering, place your soldering tool on both parts. If you're trying to solder this area right here, which we want a solder joint between the copper and the metal here also some solder in this between both pieces here 
and then we're going to put some heat on the very top of it and get solder to run down in there. It cannot touch any metal. N none of this can touch metal or it's going to ground out. So we got to keep the solder from running completely all over the place. But you want a good solid flow for a solid connection. We're using a liquid flux pre-clean for the solder joints. Um, any kind of paste flux that's available in your common plumbing store would do fine. But a 60-40 mix of um, solder. The thing that I wanted to point out is it's a .062 diameter. Uh, we're using this brand here. You could use uh, also Kester would be a good name brand. Actually this solder joint um, isn't too bad. I've done better. But it gets the point across. You can see how the flow has gone down in between the two parts and smelted it together. And also notice how I have solder on the seam where the copper part wrapped around and was against the aluminum. There's copper on that seam right there. There's solder on that seam right there. At this time we can do a little bit of cosmetics. Um, if you want to take your wire brush and just go all around, get some of the rust off, uh, you should take um, probably about um, 120 grit or less sandpaper, 200 grit even, and just take the tarnish off of the slip rings. Uh, also take your wire brush and get all the rust off the shaft. Kind of clean up the uh, threads a little bit with the wire brush, not real tough, but get as much um, of the old Loctite off of the shaft that you can because we're going to be cut putting a couple drops of uh, new red Loctite on there and we want a fresh bind. Once you get it cleaned up a little bit you can take this opportunity to apply a little bit of paint if you want to just to kind of keep the rust down uh, cover up the copper and if you get uh, a little bit of paint on here would be a good thing it would help keep tarnish and corrosion off any kind of paint really. Uh, varnish and red insulating paint of course is the best but um, just basically any kind of spray paint really is all you're really after. It's varnish down in there so if you get paint on there it's just going to cover up the varnish and help it to last. I'm using a three corner file not to remove a lot of stock but just to get a nice fresh cut metal edge so that I can get a better solder joint. Once you're down to fresh metal that's the best solder joint that you can get. This is the smaller diameter rotor. This is the 95 amp version which is beefed up to approximately 140 amps when you use our kit but I wanted to show you that the leads on the slip ring replacement are longer they don't stop right about here like they do on the uh, on the high amp rotor it comes on around and it becomes more important to focus on a good seam of solder in this area right here. Make sure that on its way around it's vertical straight up and down and then you can even push in a little bit on it as you're trying to solder. I don't recommend hemostats in this case because they'll sink a lot of heat out and make your solder joint in the other area not good. But um, you, you um, need to focus 
a little bit more on getting a good solid seam right here so that it can't fly open from centrifugal force. Here you can see the nice smooth line where the back of the piece meets the front of the piece so that there can be no uh, problems with it coming open later or flying apart. And then looking down on it you can see where everything melted really well and soaked down in making it one solid piece. One thing to try and avoid is something like this which just adds extra weight and uh, it's not the end of the world but it can cause you some problems you want to try and heat that up again and then push that off and get it to go away because you can see where there was a little too much solder applied which is easy to do and it didn't go down in it was probably already full and it just kind of molten over the side and formed a drip uh, which is going to be dead weight and you want to and it won't do any connection so you want to try and avoid that that should probably be just reheated a little and corrected so that there's not a big drip there okay here's the drive-in plate we're going to address the bearing and go with a little bit of cosmetics. You see the two, the three screws holding the bearing in here and here and here. Those are 5 16 heads. Take them out. If you break one off, don't worry about it. As long as you got one good one and the rest of the plate is good, no cracks on the sides, then we'll show you how to deal with it. Before you go to take them out you can flip it upside down and get as much rust bust in there as you can. We're going to take the bearing out. This is just your average three quarter inch extension. You can see where we've been beating on it. and um, You don't want to use your snap on or your Mac tools for this just go down to uh, and get the cheapest uh, 79 cent thing you can use that way it's not destroyed it comes right out and here we have the bearing cover and you can see the three screws but let's say that uh, one of them or two of them broke which is not at all uncommon the way you deal with it is you take a hacksaw or a wizard wheel and make a cut right here and right there. So it comes out looking like that and then when you're ready to put it back together you just lay that on the side and put that one screw in and that will hold the bearing. We've been doing this for about 20 years and we probably got a bazillion of them out there that it works no side effects moving on we're going to talk about bearing installation and cleaning and cosmetics you have two ways you can clean them at home uh, you can use a glass beater if you have access to one or you can just take uh, a wire brush or a buffing wheel and go around and clean everything up. After you've cleaned everything and are ready to paint, which we'll talk about in a minute, you put the plate in the oven for 15 minutes at 300 degrees, which expands it enough to drop the bearing right in. You can also, if you really want to get fancy, you can put the bearing in the freezer for a uh, 15 minutes or a little bit longer and it's guaranteed to fall right in. We recommend a thin line, not really a layer, but just a, a little bit of 271 red Loctite around the outside, just around the outside of the bearing. Or you can 
drop it right in. This kind of goes without saying, but after you've put the bearing in, uh, put the three screws and the bearing cover or the one screw with the modified bearing cover back in. If you use the wire wheel and wire brush to clean up your alternator plate and um, you feel that you've got a little bit of dirt to hide, you can use Rust-Oleum Hammered Finish. It's a uh, silver in color. It comes in, it comes in various colors, but uh, some of you will want to match the detail that's on the rest of your engine. So you can paint it with just about anything that's going to take a little bit of high temperature. But we've used this at certain times for different things and it holds up really well. It gives you a little bit of a crinkle look to hide imperfections. If you were able to glass bead your plates, this product here is available at uh, readily available at various hardware stores and Walmart, Lowe's, and it's got a lot more revealing finish, but it's a very desirable look. Also another product you can use that may be available in the field is a type of paint called Cast Blast. This one's by Seymour Paints and um, you can see it's got a grayish tint to it. These are two products that we use here and um, something that would be similar to it would be available at most big box auto parts stores. This is what we use on the windings. You can spray on the stator windings and also on the rotor windings or on the rotor body itself. The tinted ignition sealer or the red insulating varnish. This is just some gloss gold paint that we painted the bolts with. On the 3G the bolts are visible. But after you're done painting, be sure and go back and clean off the surfaces where it's going to mount to the block because the ground path is just as important as the hot path. They're equally important. So you have to take a piece of sandpaper, wire brush, or a buffing pad, and uh, like a sanding pad, and clean off where the bolts are going to go through both sides best to just to go ahead and do all of them. Um, for this style alternator here, it mounts up here and here on both sides where they go to the block and then put a thin layer of white lithium grease there when you're done. Also, be very cautious of the Ford truck style that has the auxiliary bracket back here. We need the back plate to be grounded as well as the front plate. So you have to buff that and put some white, just a thin layer of white lithium grease on there. Also it's a good idea to, to uh, clean up the mating parts where they go to the block or the brackets. And you don't want to get paint on the inside. This surface area here on the inside of these lids and, and in here there's no need to paint in there, so try to keep the paint out of there as much as possible. But long story short, um, a lot of you are going to be doing powder coat or uh, wanting to match the intake manifold, or the uh, you you want to um, use the paint of your the color of your choice. Um, just make sure that you go back and clean up the ground spots and. Uh, don't get any on the inside where we need connection. would like to show you a little bit about the kit. First of all, the regulator is made by a company called USI. Very dependable. You can expect 100,000 miles out of this with the proper care and usage. 
the slip ring has already been installed and we painted the rotor with the red insulating paint that we showed you earlier. The bearing in the back has to have tolerance rings on it for expansion and contraction. Also the drive-in bearing which is a plain roller bearing is a high quality bearing and we give you a nut and lock washer just to make sure everything's copacetic. The stator is a new American wound high amp output. This will get you 40, 50, up to 70 amps increase from stock. Comes with a new rectifier. They're all, all of the joints are spot welded for high amp. All of the solder joints, all of the uh, diode joints with the rectifier are spot welded. And then the stator is silver soldered in. We do that for you before we send it. So now we're ready to start putting everything together. Starting to put everything back together, we want to point out that the inside diameter of the drive-in housing has been cleaned out completely. If you're not using a bead blaster and you want to finish cleaning it out without a wire brush or whatever, you can use a flapper wheel. We recommend two inch with a quarter inch shank so you can put it in your drill or air gun, whatever you got. But the bearing's already been installed. Take this point right here and double check that the 516 heads if you're using three of them or one of them is very tight. The um, You can always use a little bit of blue Loctite on the threads as well. Also what we're going to do is take a little bit of white lithium grease just a tiny thin layer and spread that around with your finger all the way around on this inside race to keep any future corrosion out. Now we're ready to put the rotor in. This has been thoroughly cleaned. Just set that down in there and push it all the way down so that the spacer mounts up against the bearing. There's no other spacer in there. It can also be a really good idea to put some 271 red Loctite just a little bit right where the bearing rides. Then you're ready to put the pulley, lock washer, and nut. After we tighten that up, the drive-in assembly, we can take our bearing, set it down on there, just tap it lightly. And when you're trying to, when you're tapping on it, try to tap just on the middle. Or take a 10 millimeter or 3 8 quarter inch drive socket so that when you tap on it and tap on the socket so that when you hit on it you're just tapping on the inner race. Don't hit the outer race at all. It's bad for the bearing. It's not really very critical but just go ahead and tap it on so that it's flush right here. Don't bother going all the way down. If it needs to be if it can go a little bit farther on that'll take care of itself when we go to put the back plate on. We're going to tighten up the pulley pretty much just the opposite of the way we took it off. Put a rag around the pulley, hold it with one hand, and then we have a uh, 
half inch impact or electric air or electric if you do have a setting on your gun it's technically 90 foot pounds we prefer about 120 looking at the slip ring end plate or the back plate if you didn't have it glass beaded you're going to have to take either a piece of sandpaper or a good wire wheel and completely go around this edge we want to make sure that all the corrosion is off of all that edge all the way around so we can get good contact with our rectifier then we're going to take our white lithium grease and put a thin layer all the way around dab it on here and there and then take your finger and smear it evenly all the way around just a very thin layer to prevent corrosion in the future now we're going to set the back plate onto the rectifier assembly it fits down on there loosely you don't have to put the red battery post insulator on there you can if you want to we don't so that we have the option to put our extension post on there if there is one it doesn't really insulate anything so like I said you can put it on there if you want to but it's not necessary at this time we want to find our lineup marks the two little dots that we put on there in the beginning before disassembly or the scratch or the cut or however you decided to mark it we're ready to set this down on there and this particular one lines up right here this seems to fall on a little bit a lot of times it requires a little bit of tapping around the edges make sure everything's seated well once you're at this point you may encounter some resistance as you go to spin it this one doesn't but it wouldn't be uncommon to have a little bit of a a, a hit in there and this can be adjusted and the reason for that is these stacks in here these laminations are very difficult for the winder to get in there absolutely perfectly round uh, quite often there's little pieces sticking out and they're not exactly in there perfect maybe a thousandth or two thousandths out and they're likely to rub on the rotor itself as it spins Sp especially because the rotor has been um, had corrosion on it for all these years so what you can do is take the ball side of your ball and peen hammer and tap those back lightly or you can also use your flapper to go around and clean the inside out be very careful not to hit any copper you just want to hit the uh, the lamination area if you do accidentally slip onto uh, and just put a little ding in any of the copper it's not a good thing but you can it's not really going to hurt anything as long as most of it's still there there really isn't a lot of uh, repercussions for that just try the best you can to stay away from the copper and just concentrate on having a nice steady clean out on that when you're done blow everything out of there get all those chips out of there we are going to do this for you but it would really be a good idea just to go ahead and inspect it for yourself this area right here all the way around this is next to the rectifier make sure that these are pushed back as as far as you can you can take the ball of your hammer and kind of tap them back a little bit
Then we're going to tap lightly on the top to set the back plate onto the bearing. Line everything up. Put your three bolts in. If this goes on too loosely, that's a bad thing. If you don't have to tap it down because of the bearing fitting too loosely in the back plate, doesn't often happen, but you're going to want a new back plate. Tighten down your 5 16 bolts. Put your bearing cover back on. And give it a spin. See if everything spins okay. If you do encounter a little bit of a uh, nick on the sides, a little bit just of a hit, nothing major. If it's major, then you, if it locks up, and, and you can't even turn the pulley then you have to get that spinning you can tap on it all the way around the sides and then after it settles in a little bit retighten your bolts but you have to get it so that it'll at least spin if there's a, a little bit of a nick or a little bit of a hit don't be upset about it just go ahead and install the alternator this one here came out nice and clean but quite often they don't, they have to be broken and you just hit on the sides wherever you, when you feel it hit somewhere, wherever it catches at stop at that spot and tap on it right there so as you get it broken, as you get it to work and uh, gradually it'll, it'll um, work its way in by tapping on the sides and if it's a really bad spot you can always take it back apart and use your flapper a little bit more because you'll be able to see a rub mark on the inside wherever it was rubbing at and you know you can concentrate on that, on that area with the flapper but just get it so it pretty much spins if it's got a little bit of a nick to it don't be concerned we're ready to put the voltage regulator on if you're a sand blaster or, or a um, bead blaster be sure you get all the sand out of these holes here, these threaded holes. Take your blow gun and blow them out one more time. Put a couple drops of oil in each one. What well, one drop of oil in each one. The four screws that hold down the voltage regulator have been buffed, particularly in this area right here, underneath the head of the bolt on the flange and the threads. If you really wanted to be thorough, you can take a little bit of the white lithium grease and spread it on this surface here so that the voltage regulator, the top two tabs on it, the bottom two are nothing. The top two tabs are grounds for the voltage regulator itself. So you don't want any future rust to be able to form under there at a later date or if it gets wet or if it gets antifreeze or oil on it and inhibit that connection. All there is left to do to complete the job is to pull the brush pin. Here's the brush pin right here. It's going to come with the brushes already loaded. Try not to uh, mess with that. Just take a pair of needle nose pliers and you hear both little clicks. That means that the brushes are set and you're ready to go. Installation tips make sure, absolutely sure, that your battery is completely and fully charged which means that you have to charge it at a low setting for a minimum of three hours. You can uh, just double check, I think we went over this before, but just to make sure all the ground spots have to be cleaned and you know we love this dielectric grease this this white lithium grease smear a thin layer of that where everything grounds 
Also, you can use it here on the battery post. Put a spot of it on your light. This is the terminal that puts the light out. And also put some in here so you get a good protection against oxidation.